section um, it includes requests to evaluate the emissions, to quantify the emissions, but not to include what the health impacts of those emissions may be. DRA is <coughs> it is and should be beyond the scope of this proceeding. Hi, Your Honor. Shonda Nuamu on behalf of pg &E. I would first like to clarify that uh, pg e has not raised in its application the issue of health impacts, and that was specifically deemed out of scope of phase one in the scoping memo. So just for clarification. Thank you. Anything else at this point? Yes, Mr. Wilhelm. Thank you. I feel compelled to respond to Pacific Gas and Electric's attorney's comment. The fact is that Pacific Gas and Electric has made ex parte contacts with the commission, commissioners and their advisors of talking about health issues. If we're all bound by the scoping memo. Why isn't Pacific Gas and Electric also bound by that memo? How is it that they can argue their case with decision makers or ultimately decision makers in this proceeding and we can't? Well, right now the first phase of, this, uh, of the proceeding as listed in the scoping memo is to consider PG&E's application and the uh, rate setting proposal that they have. So. We would like to focus on that first. If you feel that this, you know, is something you wish to speak to the commissioners about in ex parte communications, you're not prohibited from doing so. However, it is not currently being considered. I would this first respectfully phase. ask that you issue an order today prohibiting Pacific Gas and Electric from trying to influence decision makers at this commission on health issues when, in fact, we're being told they're not going to be part of the proceeding. This, this is highly irregular. And it's also a procedural issue for the commission and for the parties here. And it puts an undue prejudice against us that are in favor of looking at health concerns as part of this proceeding. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I will consider it. I'm not going to be issuing a ruling at this point. Okay. What I would like to do, though, at this point is take appearances. Um, and what I'd like to remind everyone is that uh, this is a combined proceeding, but it is not consolidated. Um, so although I, am, I have combined it, you know, when, as you make your appearance, please indicate whether you are a party in um, the pg and &E application, A1103014, or the UCAN uh, application, which is A1103015. Uh, so why don't we start over here with Mr. Meadows. I'm Jim Meadows from the pg and &E Smart Meter Project for the pg and &E application. I'm Shonda Nuwamu, representing Pacific Gas and Electric Company, pg and &E. I'm Candace Moyer, representing DRA. Michael Shames, representing Utility Consumers Action Network. Jim Tobin, representing the County of Marin and a number of other parties in the PG&E Action District. Your Honor, I'm Joe Guzman, also representing the County of Marin, along with Mr. Tobin. Your Honor, I'm Alan Trollum, attorney for sdg and &E in proceeding A1103015. I'm not a participant. Uh, I'm Martin Hummack. I'm representing two ratepayer groups in the San Diego Gas and Electric Service areas that I'd like to be parties in uh, uh, 1103-015. One of them is named Center for Electro-Smog Prevention, and one is Southern Californians for Wired Solutions to Smart Meters. And they're both representing people who have health impacts from the smart meters, and so they would like to make a statement as to what they think the costs of the meters should be with respect to their interest, which is their health impact. Is that this is, at this point, they're requesting party status, both yes. of them, and you will be representing them? Yes. Okay. And we can distinguish what they want in terms of their health impacts and re respect to the cost of the meter replacement. If you want us to make the statement no, now, I, or we won't. <laughs> no, I, I don't need Thank to make a statement now. Thank you. Yes. Mary Beth Brandgood from the Ecological Options Network, and we're a party in the 
um, PG&E proceeding. Sandy Maurer, EMF Safety Network, we're in the PG&E proceeding. I'm James Weil, representing Aglet Consumer Alliance, participating only in the PG&D proceeding. Steve Martino, um, Alameda County residents concerned about smart meters, uh, participant party to um, A1103014. David Wilner, representing Wilner and Associates and Consumers and Repairs in California concerning this proceeding. And we're a party to application number 11 03 014. Anyone else? Yes. Good morning. Marcel Haberger, attorney with the Utility Reform Network, which is a party to the PGE proceeding. Uh, William Sanders, Deputy City Attorney in Sydney County in San Francisco, uh, party in the PGD proceeding. Is anyone else? Okay, and then on the phone, please. Boyd Gens of Honor from the County of Lake, um, here under application 11 03 014. Okay. Um, I also have. Um, forms submitted by Mr. Tobin uh, for party status in A1103014 uh, by the following parties. The Marin Association of Realtors, the Santa Barbara Tea Party, Public Citizen, Neighborhood Defense League of California, Eagle Forum of California, the County of Santa Barbara, Consumer Power Alliance, Coalition of Energy Users, City of Seaside, and the City of Marina. Is correct. that all of them? That's correct. Okay, and Mr. Tobin, you will be the person in representing all of these. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I, I will be granting party status um, to all of these parties that I just read off. Okay, I. And Mr. Homick, um, there was, you have a request to change, and I'm not quite sure if this is a change from party status to information only for Susan Brinkman. Um, this is Martin Homick. Uh, yes, she wants to become a party to the proceeding with her group called Center for Electric Smog Prevention. Okay, and we'll And this would be a new party, and she would be participating as a separate party. As a separate party. Okay. But she wanted me to here at the hearings because she can't and she lives in the San Diego service area it's too far and she's ill okay and could she participate on her own if uh, there is a telephone access um she might I could ask but she okay I'll, I'll grant her party status um, at this point I do want to know if she if you were representing her or yes. if she will be representing herself um, um, I'll be representing her um, and uh, she may be able to participate by telephone, but she will not be able to attend the person. All right. Okay. And Dr. Ross, you are information only. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, just to remind everybody that consistent with rules 1.9 and 1.10 of the Commission's Rules of Practice and Procedure, uh, any filer must serve electronically the entire service list. I'm going to ask that all email uh, communications, you know, even if it isn't filed with the commission, uh, that it be served on the entire service list so that everyone who is information only and state service receives all communications. Uh, please remember, yes, Mr. Weil. Um, you said all email communications. Do you mean communications among the parties or communications with the commission? Communications with the commission. Um, what I'm looking at is the um, the schedule that had been submitted. Uh, some of the schedules were submitted only to the parties. Others were submitted to the entire service list. I would like to have make sure the entire service list is aware of what is being proposed. Um, 
procedural issues uh, directly to me, you do not need to serve the entire service list um, unless for some reason you felt you know, necessary to do so. Yes. Your Honor, is that in both proceedings you're addressing? Yes, it is. Okay. Your Honor, yes. Can you clarify procedural issues? Uh, procedural issues, if, um, for example, if, if you wish to attend um, a proceeding telephonically, you can just email me. You don't need to email the entire service list making that request. Uh, anything that's considered substantive that directly relates to the issues or to the resolution of the proceeding, uh, I would like to make sure that everybody is you know, included on any emails in that respect. Okay. Mr. Shen, did you have something? No. Okay. Okay. What I'd like to do now is let's let's discuss a, a combined workshop. And um, what I had said in my June 14th email is we, we do have uh, now uh, requests for opt-out options. Um, at the time I sent my email, it was just for San Diego and PG&E, and now Edison also um, has a request to provide an opt-out option. Uh, I think it's best that we consider all the available options at the same time. Uh, this avoids duplication of effort. It also allows everyone to see what, what types of options are available. Things that may be proposed in one proceeding may not you know, be considered in another uh, or proposed and you know, I would like to make sure that you know, all the possibilities are considered. And um, what I'd like to do is um, let's go through what the options are that, that are currently been proposed. Um, there is Edison's, oh, I'm sorry, PG&E's application which has a radio off option as well as uh, the relocation of the uh, of the smart meter which is uh, part of its existing tariff so I'm, I'm not sure if we should really consider that an option um, per se yes uh, yes your honor Shonda Nuwama I'll clarify so our proposal that we're seeking um, approval of is the radio off proposal and we also included as part of our application information about another option which is currently available per tariff, but we're not requesting approval of that. It's already available. Okay. okay. And in your testimony, you had also noted that uh, pg and &E had evaluated uh, a couple other options. One was a wired meter, which is a wired digital as opposed to radio transmission, and also what you would call called uh, legacy meters, either uh, digital non-communicating meters or electromechanical meters. Correct. Um, and I'm going to take that right now just as a universe of possibilities. Uh, I re recognize that you didn't propose those last two, but they are possibilities that were considered. Um, that's correct, Your Honor. pg &E did look at those as we described in our application and determined that the most feasible uh, and cost-effective was the one that we proposed, and that's why that's the one we set for. Okay. Um, Mr. Trial. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, I'd like to, to bring forth some preliminary matters. I think there's some distinctions between the pg and &E case as it stands today and the UCAN application. Uh, and I have, have some concerns procedurally <coughs> from a due process standpoint and also from a just a basic fairness and prejudicial standpoint of being uh, lumped together in, in a joint uh, workshop. But as a preliminary matter, the applicant in the UCAN matter is, is UCAN. It's not SDG&E. SDG&E has not brought forth a proposal for an opt-out. And in fact, we're the protestant in that application. Therefore, I think this is working against the rules of fairness and due process to ask us to bring forth an option of opt-out where, where the commission has not ordered us to do so. Okay. Um, at the last pre-hearing conference, uh, I know you were not present. It was Mr. Barnes, I believe? It, it was Mr. Barnes. And he had agreed to work with, um, I guess, with you and, and <coughs> come up with a proposal that was going to be filed uh, with the commission with the thought that it would be uh, work out you know, what your thoughts were, hold a workshop, 
and then file a formal proposal. Are you saying that you're not willing to do that now unless... Um, well, what I'm saying is, uh, first of all, the, it, it, when we had a pre-hearing conference on May 6th, mm -hmm. it was never contemplated that these procedures would be a joint workshop. So that's one issue. The second issue is in, in that discussion, ALJ DeBerry had asked SDGD whether we had, had looked into the possibility of opt-out and whether we had, had studied that. And then he, he said, I would like to ask you to do that. And we agreed, and Mr. Barnes stipulated that if the commission ordered SDGD to do so, that we would, would be able to do a workshop. And it was in the context of doing a feasibility study. And in fact, ALJ DeBerry used the word study. He did not submit that we would have a testimony or there to be a formal proposal. It was a means of having a workshop to look at the, the potential options and see if they're feasible and look at the cost advantages or disadvantages of those options. But here, it's in a different context. You're asking us to join a joint workshop and you're asking us to waive our rights of opposition in this proceeding. And you're asking us to forego retaining those rights for appeal. I, I think that that cuts differently. Okay. Your Honor, uh, yes. I, I again feel compelled to respond. Uh, what was just stated on the record is contrary to my understanding of Judge Tiberi's earlier order to San Diego Gas and Electric. My understanding is that he ordered the utility to prepare and submit an application for an opt-out <coughs> arrangement, and as part of that, he also asked San Diego Gas and Electric to include an analog meter. I do not have my complete file with me here today, but I'll be happy to submit whatever references I can provide to the commission on that point. In fact, that wasn't the case. Uh, ALJ DeBerry said, I would ask, and then he further followed up with a, there was an open item, which is that we were going to have a discussion, Mr. ALJ DeBerry and myself, when I returned. On or about the 15th of May, we had that discussion, and ALJ DeBerry told me to hold off on the opt-out. He then issued an email to the service list that stated there was no workshop scheduled and there was no plan to be submitted until a ruling by the assigned commissioner was issued. And that occurred on the 20th of May. I, I guess, Your Honor, David Wilner, again, just for the record so we're clear, I'm understanding San Diego Gas and Electric to tell us today that they will not file an opt-out option in this uh, in the proceeding of all you can. Thank you. Your Honor, we, didn't, uh, we said that we were not proposing an opt-out plan. We're willing to look at a study, a feasibility study, and look at the different options and the costs that would be associated. That's what we discussed in the last pre-hearing conference. But to be lumped into a joint workshop and be prejudiced by the issues that have occurred that are quite different from our, our territory as what's occurred in PG&E's territory. For instance, we're at 98% rollout or deployment. We've had less than 400 people inquire about the smart meters. That's consistently different than what's occurred in PG&E's territory. So I think it would be prejudicial. So what I'm saying is that if the commission wants us to submit a plan that you should order us to do so, we should be, have control of our own application and not be controlled by UCAN because it's UCAN's burden of proof in their application to show their option is, is feasible or warranted. Okay. Would you, so you would not be willing to be, to be part of a workshop to look at what types of options could be provided uh, for opt-out. We would be willing to participate in a workshop, but we wouldn't be willing to have it as a formal proposal from SDG&E. No, I was not planning for it to be a formal proposal. Yeah, for for SDG&E and, and, and also for Edison, uh, my feeling is that all three utilities should participate. We should look at what types of options and proposals are out there. Uh, PG&E has already submitted theirs. However, you know, Edison and I know San Diego have not supposed, you know, provided anything in terms of proposals, whether or not uh, this commission will order them to, or whether they'll be willing to submit proposals on their own, I think is yet to be seen. It may come out of the workshop that you'll 
be willing to do something on your own. Yes, we are willing to participate. And, um, you know, that's that's what I'm asking for is the combined workshop where at least we have some studies and some, some information from San Diego. This is what we think are some of the options out there. Um, if there are options that are being proposed by other parties, it would be helpful to have, you know, uh, the utilities there together to say these options are are not feasible because of this. They are feasible because of that. I, I would like to have that together. Um, this is something that is you know, that is being considered by all. You know, I shouldn't say considered by all three utilities, but it is being considered in all three utility territories. And um, to the extent that there is some commonality on what could come out, you know, maybe that's where it's developed is at the workshop. You know, it co could come out that there are different options you know, that are being provided by each utility. You know, yes, Your Honor, we would be open know. to that as long as it's in the context of what I just described because yes. I do not want to prejudice my client by participating or speaking to issues mm -hmm. at a workshop when we have a pending protest in the UCAN matter. Yes. And uh, with respect to the, the UCAN application, I would not do anything on that until after if a proposal is submitted, I think after the workshops, we would have to come back with another PHC to discuss scope and schedule based on whatever did come out of the workshop. Very well. I just wanted to make it clear on the record. Thank you for your time. Your Honor, would you please uh, bear with me one step further? I, I am getting confused. I read your letter concerning the workshops and so forth. And I understood from your writing that whatever happens to PG&E happens to the other investor-owned utilities in California insofar as, although this <coughs> proceeding is not characterized as a quasi-legislative proceeding, I think this, what happens here applies to San Diego Gas and Electric. Did I misunderstand your letter? You did misunderstand it. I you know, um, had looked at the transcript uh, from the last PHC. I, there was some discussion both by DRA and Mr. Barnes at the time on why the proceedings should not be combined. Uh, there are common issues, however, uh, there, there are reasons, you know, given such as the, the difference in the type of meters, uh, the degree of deployment, and um, yeah, I think there were a couple other issues, I can't remember exactly what else was discussed, that um, has led me to think that, you know, with common issues for all three, such as consideration of what types of options are there, uh, those can be combined and considered together. But specific rate making issues and the specific options offered by each utility uh, should not be combined together. Thank you. Yeah. Janet Combs with Southern California Edison Company. We are not a party to either of the proceedings, but I wanted to note that we share some procedural concerns that Mr. Trial has voiced here today. Um, that said, I mean, we are willing to participate in a workshop to look at the range of potential options, but as you are well aware, no doubt, the costs for various options are going to differ between the utilities, and that's going to be a very uh, determinative factor in what's realistic and feasible in each service area. Um, so certainly, while we're willing to speak conceptually at a workshop, ultimately we'll have to look at that issue, the cost issue, the uptake rate potentially in our service area, and other determining, determinative factors in order to bring forth a proposal eventually. Um, timing is an issue for us as well. Obviously, we're only halfway through a deployment, and the concerns in our service area are much different, I think, than what we've seen in pg and &E service area in particular. So just want to note our willingness to do so, but sharing some of the similar concerns that Mr. Trial has expressed. Okay, thank you. Um, Your Honor, Candace Moy for DRA. Um, I just wanted to note that uh, DRA is very supportive of the idea of having a combined workshop um, to address what the options are. And, and I think as a basic matter, it's important that all utilities participate in that discussion um, because it really is not about the rate setting issues. It is just getting the options out there, I think, um, is common to all three. And then as a procedural matter, I mean, we, should, we filed a motion on Friday requesting um, that the commission expand the scope of the proceeding to include studies about RF emissions. Um, but also to order PG&E to serve some supplemental testimony 
providing its own cost estimates of um, what an analog meter option might look like. Now, DR, DRA believes that it would be extremely beneficial to hold a joint workshop um, first, and then out of that could come some very constructive ideas uh, and suggestions for how to then frame additional proposals. Um, but ultimately, we believe that it is the utility's burden of proof um, to prove that any rates it will impose as a result of the opt-out are just and reasonable. And therefore, um, whatever options are discussed, the cost proposal should initially come from PG&E and San Diego Gas and Electric and Southern California Edison, albeit in separate proceedings if that's how the commission decides to proceed. Um, but that it's very important to have that come initially from the utilities so that other parties have sufficient opportunity to respond and challenge. Um, but initially, we do think a, a joint workshop would be very beneficial. Your Honor, Shonda Nuamu for PG&E. I, I just want to clarify that PG&E is the applicant uh, in the proceeding, and PG&E has proposed its option. They only have one proposal on the table. Although they said they looked at other options, they deemed them not feasible, not as um, effective and efficient as the radio law proposal. So the other options that you mentioned are not PG&E's proposal. And PG&E agrees that it has the burden on its proposal as applicant, but not on other parties' proposals. And, you know, DRA said they filed a motion. PG&E's position on that, and we will file a response, is that PG&E is happy to respond to data requests to DRA if they want to ask questions specific to what costs may be for analog meters. But PG&E is not proposing that. PG&E is the applicant and its proposal is on the table. If DRA would like to take that information and develop a proposal for analog meters, and DRA is free to do that. And that is consistent with the original scoping memo. It said other parties may present proposals. They need to frame those as they would see fit. And so I just wanted to make that, that clear that as applicant, we have set forth our proposal. And that's what we would talk about at the workshop, our radio op proposal. OK. At the, um, in your application, you had stated that you evaluated the um, other options. Uh, did you do any cost evaluations or anything to determine that they were not feasible, or did you? What did you do? Right, we did some preliminary cost evaluations on a number of options. At a certain point, it became clear to us that both operationally and for cost, and based on where we were with our deployment, that radio off was the best option. At that point, we continued to flesh out the radio off option and get that to a point where we could submit it as our proposal and testimony. So there are some, you know, there is some early um, development of cost estimates, but it was not taken to um, completion because we determined that the radio off uh, proposal was the best proposal. Your Honor, one comment, if I may, following up on PG Lee's attorney's comments. As a party in the proceeding with limited resources, like many of the other parties, it's not possible for us to prepare a cost study and a cost recovery study to substantiate the analog meters as being a more desirable alternative. I believe DRA brought this point out uh, in its motion uh, along these lines. I'd like you to keep that in mind, Your Honor, that none of us really have the horsepower, so to speak, that is the technical resources, the computers, the customer database, and on and on to do this sort of thing, but it's absolutely mandatory in this proceeding that the option of having an analog meter be considered <clears throat> in all, from all respects. pg and &E may feel that it's not economically feasible to do it, but the parties may, and so may the Commission. So I would urge you in the process, and maybe as part of the instructions for the workshop, that we do delve into that issue. Thank you. Yes, it's Candace Moria for DRA. Um, PG&E's testimony includes just a very short shrift uh, statement, pretty conclusory, saying that the analog meter option is infeasible. Um, at this point, DRA is not proposing an analog meter option. Whether or not DRA would propose that option depends on how much it would cost. That information originates from PG&E. Um, and then there's a lot of estimates that have to go into that, that um, DRA is really not in the best position to apply to the facts PG&E is. Um, and 
just to complete the issue, PG&E's responses, which are, well, our application proposes radio off, that's it, that's all that's on the table, is precisely what DRA is concerned about, that we will get into evidentiary hearings and PG&E will have simply tried to skirt the issue by not offering any cost estimates of an analog proposal. Ultimately, we don't think that that will be the best, most efficient process or the most protective of parties' due process rights in this proceeding. And that, you know, up front to have the commission order PG&E to serve some supplemental testimony, just outlining what that <coughs> option might look like, um, and having the benefit of a workshop to focus what the option might be constructed as would be a much better way to proceed. Again, just Sean, <laughs> Sean and Uwamu, um, just to respond uh, for pg &E. As I just stated, pg &E would be willing to provide responses to specific requests about cost as they are related to analog meters. PG&E as applicant should not be forced to provide a proposal that pg &E does not feel is the best proposal for um, its customers. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Michael Shames of UCAN. Well, I think we've, we've begun constructively trying to frame the discussion of the workshops and what yeah. will be involved in the workshops. So I think we're making progress. And, and what I've heard thus far is that um, you have an expectation that the utilities and the parties will discuss the various options that would be available. And, and I think that's helpful. But there's, as this discussion sort of highlights, the issue of costs of these options and the rate or potential rate impacts of those options would also need to be discussed in order for the workshop, I think, to be constructive. And I think that is going to require a direction from you to the utilities and any other party that the workshop um, will include discussions on those and that the party should come prepared to discuss them. Uh, there may be an issue of having to conduct discovery before the workshop to be able to get information from the utilities. Uh, and that also may be discussed, but I would hope perfectly that that not be the case, that formal discovery wouldn't be required and that instead uh, just the utilities would be instructed that at this workshop they should have available basic, not in depth, but basic cost and rate impacts of each of the options. And perhaps, and this might be a, a useful uh, construct, is to have all parties submit to the utilities various options that they would like to be discussed prior to the workshop so the utilities could be prepared with that cost and rate impact general information for discussion at the workshop. Your Honor, I, I don't know the number of parties that we have here, but I think this goes to part of the problem is that if every party decides that they have their pet proposal that they would like to require the utilities to present, I think that's very inefficient, I think it's ineffective, and I don't think that we're going to be moving forward to a resolution. And so what we've done is we filed an application, we've presented our testimony, we've presented our data, and other parties have an opportunity, if they think something's better, to present a counter position. Sandy Maurer, EMF Safety Network. Um, Your Honor, the, the underlying reason that uh, President Peavy ordered the opt-out in the first place was because of uh, considerable concerns from ratepayers about the radio frequencies and the health impacts. And there are people who are being seriously harmed right now, and pg &E has been uh, unaccountable for these um, health impacts that people are suffering from. The EMF safety members do not want the radio off uh, option. They want to keep their analog meters, and they will resist. And um, the situation uh, on the ground is that this is where people are locking up their meters, they're building cages around their meters, they will resist. This, this radio off proposal by pg &E will not address the concerns of the ratepayers. And uh, so it's an inadequate proposal. So I, I really appreciate your inclusion of the possibility of looking at the analog as an option uh, because without that option, uh, there will be no satisfaction uh, for the ratepayers for those concerned. And it's actually beyond concern. People are being harmed. 
and this, this should be addressed in workshops. We need to have hearings on health impacts. People need the opportunity to be heard about how the meters are impacting them. The EMF Safety Network has started a survey, and we've had um, over 300 respondents so far, and, and of those with meters on their homes, about a third of them have them on their bedrooms. Um, and I'm, I'm getting a little off track. Um, can, can, yes, so I just focus on the options. Mm -hmm. So I, I do appreciate your inclusion of the analog. Uh, the radio off option will not um, appease the EMF safety net members or those concerned about this for health reasons. And I would encourage you to please include um, the health impacts in, 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 a, in a workshop or evidentiary hearings. Thank you. Your Honor, Marcel Haberger with Kern. Um, I, I'm encouraged very much by, well, both pg &E's agreement that they would be willing to provide data in responses uh, concerning costs. Um, I think it would be much more efficient, however, if we could agree on a limited number of scenarios that pg &E would look at and evaluate for cost impacts. I've uh, found it uh, somewhat difficult to obtain uh, data through data responses uh, uh, to this point. And I would say that um, I would strongly disagree um, uh, with Ms. Uh, Ms. Nwamu that there are a lot of parties with pet proposals. I think if we look at the filings today, there's really only about three significant proposals on the table, which are all variants. You know, there's PG&E's proposal. There is uh, the idea that there should be uh, a radio off, opt out, but on a municipal-wide basis to address the concerns about freak radio frequency emissions from other meters. And, and that may have some cost impacts uh, that are positive or negative, uh, it's hard to say. Then there's the uh, second, the alternative of the opt out for individuals using the analog meter. And I think there would be a combined variant which is the opt out using an analog meter on a municipal basis, um, on a municipal basis. And, and really those are the primary uh, variants that I've seen. Now, you know, I, I have a variant, but it's really just a, a variant of pg es method and uh, really is a cost question that I will continue to pursue. Um, but I think that if pg e could provide an analysis of the potential cost impacts of uh, those uh, three additional scenarios, we would go a long way towards being to evaluate uh, the primary proposals that um, have been raised to date. Thank you. What is your uh, variant? Um, well, my variant is really, um, we're lo looking at pg es proposal of a radio off, but with a different methodology for uh, doing the radio off, meaning uh, trying to see if we could do it without an actual on-site trip uh, visit to do the radio off, uh, and that also might involve an alternative of radio off only for the electric meter, but not for the gas meter, um, depending on uh, technical feasibility and uh, costs. So um, that, that's kind of what I'm exploring at this point now. And yeah. Your Honor, just to respond, I mean, I think DRA fully agrees with um, Turn's position on this, that, uh, but with one tweak, which is that we think it is important to hold a workshop to make sure that all the parties have sufficient opportunity to um, address what are their pet proposals and to come up with what um, the Commission thinks would be the right set of scenarios for PG&E to request. Um, but just to note, you know, with respect to discovery, DRA has begun um, propounding discovery in this case, and although uh, we probably could word some questions a little bit more specifically, we've asked for some information about analog meter options. Um, PG&E's response has been to say that that issue is outside of the scope of the proceeding, because PG&E, um, as it's set forth, has determined that an analog meter opt-out is infeasible. Um, and to be fair, PG&E has then provided an answer, but if the, if the attitude throughout the case will be that um, we'll only give you a response if we feel like it, uh, and perhaps to obstruct constructive cross-examination of its witnesses, um, then you know, I think that really concerns DRA. 
Um, and in addition, the question requested information about costs associated with inventory analog meters, PG&E just responded that it had not developed those costs. So, you know, I think we just agree, or we're very strongly convinced that a more efficient and due process oriented procedure would include having PG&E serve supplemental testimony. Your Honor, David Wilner, if I may. Uh, first, thank you for indulging us, allowing us to run down these streets, these streets filled with questions. Turn is, is right on, in my opinion. We don't have a table full of options. One option which PGD has proposed is the radio off. The second option, as I understand, is the analog meter. That's what we're in favor of. I'm not aware of any other options in terms of pet uh, options as suggested by PG&E. I think you would assist us greatly, Your Honor, if you would narrow this issue down. Oh, I should add to that that we also have discovered a request outstanding with PG&E. We're in the same boat. Information on analog meters is not going to be available because the scope doesn't provide for that. I'm anticipating a response. This leads us to motions to compel and protracted discovery doesn't get us close to a workshop and a workable form for this hearing. So perhaps you could assist us by asking pg e to add an additional option, which is the analog meter, to give us some prepared testimony to work with uh, the cost and cost recovery that would be attached to that. Thank you. Your Honor, Shana Nuamu, I'd, I'd like to respond to DRA. Uh, I think that pg e has been very cooperative in its attempt to respond to lots of discovery <coughs> requests from multiple parties. As DRA acknowledged, although there are questions that are outside of the scope, we have oftentimes provided a response. <coughs> to me, that doesn't show obstructionists, that shows cooperation. So I'd like to make that point. Um, in addition to that, uh, the parties seem to forget that we have a scoping memo. We have a scoping memo that was issued after a pre-hearing conference. The majority of these issues have been raised and have been ruled on in a scoping memo. So I think that it's perfectly proper for PG&E to say we have a scoping memo and we are going to continue Louder, to we are going to continue to proceed with our case, but consistent with the scoping memo. And so I don't know. I don't think that we should be um, uh, blamed for that. That's the purpose of a scoping memo. Um, my recollection is that at the uh, May 6th hearing, there were a number of proposals made about maintaining the uh, analog meter that was already in place and not pulling it out. Um, the purpose of that proposal was that there would be no cost to PG&E or anybody else to leave the analog meter in place. Now, I want to bring up that we have to then look at two possibilities with respect to analog meters. Because one opt-out option that would have an analog meter replacing a smart meter would be that the smart meter would be removed and an analog meter put in in those cases where a smart meter had already been installed. And the other case is where there are still analog meters that have not been replaced. Now, in response to those two possibilities, PG&E has not come up with any cost estimate for either one. And I would for one, like to hear them come up with a cost estimate for leaving the analog meter that is still in place there. How many do we have? Well, PG&E has a long list of people who have signed up for last install or delay. They have these last install and delay lists of people who don't want to have a smart meter put in now these customers all have an analog meter still in place. And I would like to hear PG&E come up with a cost estimate of leaving that analog meter in place 
leaving it alone and doing absolutely nothing with it. But what I am proposing here is that in a workshop, those two possibilities for an analog meter being the substance of an opt-out option need to be addressed as separate because in the one case, PG&E, from my estimation and my sense of logic, would have no costs at all to leave the analog meter in place, whereas in the other, if somebody wanted an analog meter back, then they might be able to say, well, there's a cost in sending somebody out to replace the smart meter with an analog meter. Those are two possibilities. I think they both need to be on the table in a workshop. Um, thank you, Your Honor. And uh, I, I very much support what Mr. Martino sorry if I missed yeah. Martino uh, said. And I guess I'd just like to maybe address a uh, sort of bigger picture issue primarily to PG&E. I, I think that there's part of the reason why um, I think the workshop would be a very good idea and why we would like PG&E to come forward with some cost estimates is that this proceeding is somewhat different from, I think, a typical proceeding where the utility files for authorization to make a capital investment to do something. I think in a normal case, you know, we'd go in and we'd submit data request, requests about the uh, forecast costs and maybe we'd fight about it. We'd say your cost forecast is wrong for this reason. And if it's wrong, we'll just say don't do it. You know, you haven't met your burden of proof. This is a very different type of situation. The parties, most of the parties uh, in this proceeding um, want pg and &E to do it. They maybe just want pg and &E to do something different. And so it's not just a question of attacking pg and &E's cost forecast. It's actually saying, do what you've proposed, but do it a totally different way. And by the way, this is what it would cost. And you know, certainly that's directly within uh, the purview of the paragraph one in the scoping memo, which said that other parties may recommend other reasonable cost alternative methods, uh, et cetera, and shall also provide the estimated costs of any recommended alternative. Now, the problem here is that while it's possible through discovery to attack, get the bases for PG&E's cost estimates and attack them, in a normal proceeding, if, if I ask a data request for PG&E to evaluate and do a study of what a totally different alternative would cost, PG&E probably would respond by objecting, saying that they are not required to do an alternative study. And in, normally that tends to be correct. But no other party in this proceeding can actually has the cost data to come up with an alternative study. Now, through diligent data requests, maybe we can tease out some of the underlying information that's necessary to do that, but it would take a lot of work, and there are a lot of parties, and I think it would behoove PG&E, and it would make the process much more efficient if we agree that PG&E would provide some of the data and massage it in a way that would allow the commission to evaluate the potential costs of these different alternatives. And so I'm really asking PG&E for purposes of making this proceeding go smoothly to consider that perhaps a slightly different way of responding to requests for a study or alternative costs may be in order and may uh, help facilitate resolution, uh, an agreeable resolution that will put to rest or at least minimize uh, the public's concerns about the smart meters. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm not sure if Mr. Meadows needs to answer this question or if he can, Mr. Long, but uh, PG&E, and for that matter, SDG&E and SCE, and you all have the cost information. Um, I don't see it unreasonable to have parties come up with options, but they, they aren't going to be able to get the cost information unless they can get cooperation from the utilities. Um, and it appears that one of the questions is, you know, what are the costs if you know, there is an analog meter retained? Uh, you, or the existing digital uh, smart meter is replaced with an analog meter. Uh, 
you're going to know the costs, not the parties. Um, I'm not requiring that um, that be a proposal by any of the utilities, but I am going to be asking for cooperation that if the parties, um, particularly the interveners, you should get together and um, perhaps you know, turn and DRA get together as the consumer groups to to come up with you know what you would like. I don't want the utilities inundated with multiple cost requests, um, but I do feel it's reasonable that you know, they do provide cost information because nobody's going to have the costs except for the utilities. Your Honor, I, I'll respond in part to what you just said. Uh, an obvious limitation to us is the fact that pg &E would have to reconfigure its IT network if it were to retain analog meters as part of this opt-out proceeding. And that is well beyond our capabilities, and we are technical people, and I think I can speak for a turn and other groups here, it's beyond their capabilities also. We do not have the information on the mesh network and the integral parts of that system that would have to be modified to accommodate what we're talking about. If it turns out, hypothetically now, that the cost of using analog meters is very close to the cost of turning off the transmitter in the smart meter, that would be a desirable option, I'm sure, for parties here, and the commission would be in a position to make a decision. If the commission doesn't have that information, then the commission's trying to adjudicate or, or to resolve this claim uh, without proper background. So I would urge you again to ask PG&E and perhaps the other utilities to give us some testimony. It can be abbreviated some cost information both in terms of recurring cost, installation cost, and cost recovery. pg and &E already has some number in its mind as to how many analog meters would be required if that option were available to consumers. So I think that they could quickly extrapolate and provide that information. I thought that little insight might be helpful to you. Yes, Your Honor, I'd just like to respond in part, I suppose. Uh, I think that the issue of, of retaining the mechanical analog meter is much more complicated. First of all, you would have to look at how many uh, customers may want to opt out. It could be 1%, it could be 30%. Louder. You don't really know. And so that would have to factor into the cost. But most importantly, it's only a stopgap measure. The meters are no longer manufactured. It soon will no longer be available or reliable. And so I'm not sure it's a viable option. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. In terms of liability, um, we will consider that after we've actually looked at the various options. Um, so, so from from that respect, you know, I I do appreciate your discussion of the opt out, you know, or not. I'm sorry. The cost to retain analog meters will depend on the percentage of. Um, Party, you know, individuals and resident uh, customers who would opt out, and um, you know, if if interveners or if uh, turn or DRA, if you you are considering an opt out, you know, um, using the analog meters, you you need to be a little bit more specific before they can give cost. I, I, I'm not going to have the utilities providing information that's you know, where you you whoever is going to be proposing that option do not have some basis of you. We think this percentage of customers would opt out um, to get better information for the utilities. Ms. Mori. Um, Your Honor, I just uh, with respect to the last point regarding how um, and the point that you made earlier that the other interveners can get together and come up with what are what scenarios do we want to see. I think that your original proposal to hold a joint workshop um, is exactly the, the right forum to do that and to involve the utilities in that discussion is critical because there may be some issues that the interveners don't know with regards to what IT workarounds might be required to, to propose different alternatives. Uh, DRA's position at this point is that some more information is better 
and to have an open discussion and open dialogue about the basic technological impacts, um, barriers, uh, and then from there move on to decide, well, what, what do we think it makes sense to look at the cost? What do we really want to have provided to the other parties and to have the utilities provide that? So we strongly um, agree with uh, having the joint workshop and proceeding from there. Okay, what I would like to do is I'm, I'd like to take a short break, maybe 10 minutes at this point. And uh, while we are off the record, uh, what I would like you to think about is, um, I've, you know, based on what we we're discussing, it looks like it's going to be more than one workshop. And um, I'd like to get some thoughts from all of you on, you know, if we're going to do more than one workshop, you know, how should it be structured, and you know, if you think it can be done only, you know, through just a one single workshop, you know, is it a single day, you know, is it a single day workshop, I should say, uh, how should that be done? Uh, if I may, so, I'd like to make one response to what Mr. Wilner had mm -hmm. said, uh, because it's part of this particular moment in the conversation. Um, if there are a large number of people who have so far refused smart meters, and they're on last oh, install this, this or delay meter. list, uh, mm -hmm. wait a minute. I'm sorry. You, let's let's hold it until after the break. Right, okay. Want, Thank you. We're off the record. One.